to this video on elemental composition of pure substances. So if we're trying to classify pure substances and we're looking at matter as a whole, it's going to be the stuff that does not have variable composition. So it is uniform throughout, not only how it looks, but also in its composition. And then we can go ahead and further subdivide that by asking ourselves, is there more than one element? And if the answer is no, of course, it's an element or an atom. And if it is yes, then it is a compound. And we can go between elements and compounds using chemical change. So we have some laws of proportion in chemistry. And the first law is the law of definite proportion. And it states that compounds with the same elements in the same proportions are the same compound. And the law of multiple proportions says that compounds with the same elements in different proportions are not the same compounds. So here's an example of that. So say we have one gram of carbon. And if the one gram for every one gram of carbon, there's 1.33 grams of oxygen, then we would have carbon monoxide, CO. And if there's two, one to 2.66 grams, then we would have CO2. So if you have anything that has the one to 1.33 of carbon to oxygen ratio, then it's always gonna be carbon monoxide. And that would be the law of constant proportion or the law of definite proportion. And then if we see that there are different proportions between them, CO versus CO2, they have the same elements, but they're in different proportions, so they're different compounds because carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide are not the same thing. So we can do some analysis work on different compounds. And so the first thing we wanna do is find out the percent composition of compounds. And so we can break things down using chemical means in a laboratory. And we wanna know the percent composition of each element in ammonium nitrate. So we're just going to use the formula in order to determine this. Whenever we're doing percent composition, we know that percent composition of anything is going to be equal to the part divided by the whole times 100. And so we can use this in a variety of different capacities. I'm going to go ahead and do the calculations for this. I'm not using my um, calculator today just to make this go a little bit quicker. I have already pre-calculated everything. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to find the molar mass for our ammonium nitrate. Okay, so our molar mass that's going to be the whole. So we're going to have we actually have two nitrogens, even though they're not together. So we're going to do two times the mass of, height of nitrogen, 14.01 grams, plus four times the mass of hydrogen, which is 1.008 grams, plus three times the mass of oxygen, 16.00 grams. Now, I find when I do these, I don't usually um, calculate out each one of them separately before I add up my molar mass, but it actually will expedite my process a little bit here. And so each part, okay, I'm gonna actually do that down here. Um, each part is going to be the mass of the element in the overall compound. So that's gonna be our part. So two times 14.01 is going to give us 28.02 plus 4.032 grams for hydrogen. And finally, we're gonna add oxygen, which is going to be a total of 48.00 grams, okay? 
So when I'm looking at this, this first one is representing nitrogen, the second one is representing hydrogen, and the last one is representing oxygen. Okay. So if I total all of those up, I get a molar mass, which we were trying to get, of 80.05. 80, 80 So now, in order to determine each one of these individually, let's go ahead and do that. So nitrogen is going to be the 28.02 grams divided by 80.05 grams times 100 and we end up getting 35.0%. For hydrogen, we're gonna have our 4.032 grams divided by 80.05 grams times 100, and we get 5.00. Oops, or just 5.0 percent. I guess we'll go to just the tenths place here. And then finally, we should expect that the remainder should be 60 percent since we have already accounted for 40 percent. And so when we go to do the last one, we still want to double check. Every once in a while, we'll be off just due to rounding, just barely. But in this case, oxygen was 48 grams. divided by our 80.05 grams for the molar mass times 100, and I get 59.96%, and I think that we are close enough, we can say that that is definitely 60.0% when we round all of these values to the same place value. Okay. So now I wanna take a look at empirical versus molecular formulas for compounds. And so an empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio of elements in a compound. And the molecular formula is the actual ratio of elements in a compound. And so let's take a look at an example of this. So if we wanted to see um, something like glucose, okay, so let's take glucose for example. We know that the molecular formula for glucose is C6H12O6. And I kind of work backwards when I do this example. That means that the empirical formula has to be the lowest whole number ratio of C6H12O6. So I can divide everything by 6, okay? And when I do that, I get ch Two O. Now there might be many other things that could have CH2O for an empirical formula, but if it has C6H12O6, we know that it's glucose. So this is a thing that tells us that this is actually glucose. However, a lot of times the empirical formula allows us to get to that molecular formula. So let's work out a problem that asks us to determine the empirical formula of caffeine if it contains these percentages of elements. Now, you could be asked to do this by just being given grams as well. And so in that case, you just are going to divide by the molar mass of each one. In the case of starting off with percentages, we're going to take a look at this and assume a 100 gram sample. Okay, so I'm going to write that up here. Assume 100 gram sample. And when I do that, I'm going to change percents to Grams. I'm just going to change each one of these percent signs into grams. Okay, if you start with grams, you don't have to do this step. 
and you can just make that assumption you don't actually have to write that down unless you like that that actual process on there okay so now what I'm going to do is for each one of these so I'm going to start with carbon I'm going to take the the mass up here the 49.48 grams I'm going to divide that by the molar mass of carbon which is 12.01 grams per mole and that gives me 4.1199 moles okay because I'm left with 1 over 1 over moles which is going to be just moles so I do that for all of my elements so I'm going to do that for carbon for hydrogen it's 28.87 Oops, excuse me. No, it's not. That one is 5.15 grams. There we go. Divided by 1.008 grams per mole. And we get 5.109 moles. Do the same thing for nitrogen. And that gives us 2.0607 moles. And finally, oxygen. And we get 1.0306 moles. Now you'll notice I'm keeping four place values right of the decimal. I will say when it comes to these, you should be keeping quite a few digits um, to avoid rounding errors because you're having to do this in stages in your calculator. So be very cautious with that. Now that we've done this, we want to divide by the smallest number of moles for each one of them to find the ratio of moles between carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. And so we see that this one down here is going to be the smallest number of moles. So I'm going to divide everything by 1.0306 all the way along here. We want to find out what our ratio is. Okay, and again, I've calculated all these values out. Of course, the bottom one is going to be one, okay. And all of the other ones, so the first one is going to be 3.99. The second one is going to be 4.96. Nitrogen is going to be 1.99. Now, when you're doing this, you cannot just necessarily round these numbers. Sometimes when we get to this point, we have to multiply by a factor to get all numbers to be a whole number ratio. In this case, if you are within okay, 0 0.1, go ahead and round. If you are not within that margin, you may have to go ahead and multiply all of your values by a factor that gives you a whole, whole number ratios. So when I do that, I end up getting 4 to 5 to 2 to 1. And so that means my empirical formula... My empirical formula is going to be C4H5N2O. And that is the answer to this particular question. 
Now we're going to take that empirical formula and we're going to do the next step with it, which is to determine the molecular formula <laughs> for caffeine. But in order to do that, we have to know what the molar mass is. So in this case, we're given the molar mass. And so we have to first find the empirical formula mass. So let's go back and find that empirical formula again. The empirical formula was C4H5N2O. And we want to know the mass of this, okay? So we're going to find the mass of this. So 4 times 12.01 plus 5 times 1.008 plus 2 times 14.01 plus 16.00, okay? And so the mass for that is going to be 97.1. That's our empirical formula mass. So if you were given all of the data from the last one in conjunction with this and asked for the molecular formula, then you would do what we did um, to determine empirical formula first and then to find the molecular formula. So in order to find the molecular formula now, we're going to take the molar mass, which is given to us up here, and we're going to divide that by the empirical formula mass to find a factor. Okay, so let's take the 194.2 grams per mole and we're going to, oops, go back here, divide that by 97.1. And when we do that, we get a factor of 2, which means that the empirical formula mass is twice that amount is what our molar mass is. And that means we have to multiply two times our empirical formula, which was C4H5N2O. And so when we multiply that whole thing by two, okay, because of this right here, because of that factor, we get C8H10N4. Oh, and that is our molecular formula.